Good Wednesday morning, and today John is sparked by an article. This is going to be on the National Post, written by Joel Kotkin. And essentially the article title is, We're Failing Our Youth by Not Denouncing Their Craziness. And just a few first lines. The younger generation seems increasingly crazed. A worrying proportion of the young sympathizes with those who launch terror attacks against Israel, support the immediate elimination of fossil fuels, or demand the wiping out of gender distinctions. So John was reading that article, and that sparked some conversation for today's podcast. Good morning or good day, whatever time it is you're listening, jogging or whatever. Uh, thank you for your presence. Um, I want to talk to you today uh, about the young people that we're trying to teach at high school and university. There's a major problem coming our way, and we're, we can see it on the streets in the way intelligent people uh, have been trying to rationalize and be in favor of the appalling events on October the 7th and are perfectly prepared to deny that they ever happened if that suits their argument. They are so anti-Semitic, it, it's worrying. Their behavior in so many other respects is the same. Uh, people teaching young people today know that they're in trouble, very much in trouble. Uh, the majority of them, according to uh, a study in The Lancet, see the entire planet as doomed by climate change. So if that is the case, there's no point in working. Uh, they're not saving for the future. They're not paying for college. They're not buying a home, according to a 2021 Pew report. The decline in home ownership which nearly three in five young people see as an essential part of the American dream, is especially damaging. Um, it's not just happening in North America, it's happening in Europe as well. My children could not afford to live in the house we brought them up in in London uh, because prices have gone through the roof uh, in London. Uh, there are some young people, 10% of them in fact, who say they don't intend to work at all if they can avoid it and instead of saying unemployed, they say they are fun employed. Uh, they're perfectly willing to be uh, parasites on society. They are depressed. They are flattened. Uh, they have no joie de vivre. Uh, they think that there will not be jobs for them, in part because of AI. They've got a very, very gloomy account of life. Uh, I came across a review of this. I don't know if it comes up or not on the screen, but this is from the National Post on the uh, 23rd of December, I think it was. Yes, no, 28th of December. What's going on? Why is it so different than it used to be? I grew up, my first five years were wartime, I didn't, of course, know that yeah, until the, perhaps four or five I became aware of it, especially when I saw devastated buildings uh, and asked what happened. And the, the other thing that I remember clearly is barrage balloons uh, all over the country to prevent the, the Germans from landing paratroops. Uh, uh, never actually required, but... These big balloons really were fun for for children. But we were not in any way depressed, and we were not insecure and anxious. I wouldn't even let, me, let my mother take me to my first day of elementary school. I said, I can go with Brian next door. He's two years older than me, and he goes every day, so I'll walk with him. And I did. And it was all good, uh, as children used to. They used to love their teachers. Now their teachers are not giving them much to love about because they're creating anxiety by standing them in a row and asking them to put themselves whether they feel like a man or a boy or feel like a girl and try and make them spread it out as a spectrum, destroying the normal binary that has ruled humankind forever. 
Now, one of the most important things that makes you secure, somebody made the point for me the other day when I was showing them a picture of some of the, the children that my daughter has raised, having picked them off the streets in Malawi, and they smile like only African children can because they're secure. Life goes on. They lose their inventiveness very quickly. When a helicopter came to a mission station that I was at uh, a few years ago, within days, uh, the children were making models of helicopters out of banana stalks and uh, wire. Uh, some of them were very good. But all that inventiveness it is dragged away because the society, as they grow up into it, is fatalistic, and they become fatalistic. And what, of course, has happened to us is the narrative that is underlying our society, which used to be Judeo-Christian, is being taken apart and replaced by uh, narratives chosen by the so-called intellectual elite, who are no, by no means intellectually elite. Uh, so you get to the sort of state we've got to with Claudine Gay, who, whatever else you say about her, has got nowhere near the qualifications that should be required of someone who was to head up allegedly the greatest university or one of them in North America, but it's going downhill at a rate of knots. Real quality, real standards no longer apply. We, we all see it happening, but we were rather quiet on how we respond to it. I don't even call it DEI because that, that's very close to the Latin for God. I prefer DIE, which is more appropriate to what it does. But what it has done is undermine all our standard understandings of life. Now, they're in a way themselves just aping parts of what has happened to our world over, the, over my lifetime without thinking about it. In a much more serious sense, McIntyre, uh, perhaps the greatest philosopher of the, of the 20th century when he wrote After Virtue in uh, the 70s, uh, he understood that we had become a society that was literally after virtue. He, he opens his book, and I've said this before, and I'll be saying it again because it's a book I want everyone to read, really, um, with a parable. He says, um, I want you to imagine a know-nothing government taking charge. Well, that's not difficult. Uh, and they decide that all the problems in the world are due to science and scientists, a kind of uh, early version of greenness. Uh, so the, uh, the solution to our problems is to destroy the libraries, blow up the laboratories, and lynch the scientists, and then we'll have a green, new, wonderful world. And, of course, it doesn't turn out that way. They very quickly find they actually need those scientists and laboratories and libraries, but they've destroyed them. You can see that could happen here. Uh, these angry young people will destroy things that, that they do not understand. Uh, and McIntyre says, what they do is poke around in the ruins to find bits of science and teach it by rote, rather like we do much of our teaching in, in, in university. It's appropriate to teach by rote up until about the age of seven, but then you start moving on to logic if you've got any sense. But by the time you get to university, uh, yes, some things have to be put into memory. But, of course, the people who have their memory best stocked with facts are people who use them every day, and they didn't set out to memorize them as a, uh, a means of examination. But So in McIntyre's parable, they tried teaching science by rote, and, of course, it doesn't work because it has no overarching sense of what science is. Then says McIntyre, what I want you to understand in this book, that that is what I'm talking about, but not in terms of science, but in terms of morality. We have lost any overarching sense of what it is. And that is critical. 
because that provides us with a basic secureness in society. When everybody accepts the rules, even when they're not keeping them, most people do most of the time. So, growing up in Birmingham, we did not lock our doors in an industrial area, Birmingham being the British equivalent of Detroit. Can you imagine that? It still happens to many of you living in rural areas, but don't expect it to continue. It won't. Already in rural areas around where I live, uh, thieves from the city drive around the back streets, the back dirt roads, and look at houses. It looks as though everybody's gone uh, into town to work, and they check out that there is the case, and then they drive up behind the hedge where no one can see them and basically take what they want. That's the world we're moving into. And if there is no meaning to life, if it has no ultimate purpose, if it's all in the end going to be a mess and a disaster, why would you not do that? Darwin provides no basis for altruism, none at all. Read David Stowe, Darwinian fairy tales, an atheist who sees the truth and tells it. That's why I always recommend it. So what we had when I was growing up was a biblically informed set of ideas about what it meant to be a good person and what you ought not to do if you were going to be a good person. We didn't argue about them. They came in with our mother's milk. Uh, now, in the working class in Britain, they were lost to the church around the beginning of the 19th century. But fortunately, the education system in Britain remained sensible for a lot longer than it did in North America. So the Bible was read every day in school for 12 years. That made a difference to everybody. You can't help but remember it, some of it, especially the, the good bits, so to speak, the good stories. And what that does is fill the mind with meaning. Now you have Jordan Peterson becoming a multimillionaire and a world-famous intellectual by talking about meaning uh, in a very simplified version. And it went through the roof because young people, especially young men, were looking for that. So there is hope. There are people out there who are informing the public of what they've been robbed of. And hopefully we will do something about it. We do need to go back to the old ways of doing things, especially in a family. A, a family that prays together stays together, was the old phrase. But the particular point was, it, it was normal to read the Bible in, in a, a large percentage of uh, homes for many years. America was a Protestant foundation, so the Bible is central. Uh, and it was congregational because it was necessarily so as you spread out across this vast continent before there were, uh, uh, before there was a, an automobile, an internal combustion engine, and the railways uh, were minimal uh, for a long while. But you got going. The American can-do approach comes from that. When you think what they actually did, it's astonishing. I wandered down to the end of my fo farm every now and again. There's some uh, untouched woodland of 100 years old there. And you couldn't drive a, a trailer through there. They had to cut their way from the beach to the prairies, so to speak, with a lot of cutting, a lot of clearing en route just to get through. Would we do that today? I don't think so. Most of these young people just want to switch life off and they have no hope, no future. Now, that has got to change. Uh, and, no, and I juxtapose that background, the anxiety, the depression, the, the loss of drive, with uh, an older idea, which I first came across in Dorothy Sayers, uh, where she talks about uh, acedia, what the church... Uh, used to call sloth one of the deadly sins. Uh, but in the modern world, she said, it's called tolerance. Uh, tolerance is a virtue that doesn't require anything of us. It will 
believe anything, look at what the students are doing at the moment. They're tolerating Hamas because they don't want to believe the bits that are really bad. And it doesn't believe anything. It doesn't care about anything. It doesn't trust anyone. And it only remains alive because he can see no reason to kill itself. That's what tolerance really is. It's not a virtue. It's the oil to make the machinery of virtue run, but we don't have the machinery. The machinery is clear ideas about justice, truth, uh, duty, uh, etc. And those are tough things to practice, and we all fail. So tolerance is the oil to make the machinery work. We, we all understand that we're all human. We make mistakes. We do things which we regret. You need forgiveness. The worst thing about Black Lives Matter and, and many of these newer processes is, is that they don't understand that. So there is no redemption. They want to blame somebody, with, again, without any historical knowledge. And there is no possibility of them ever being uh, in a position to say, well, we'll forget about it now, we'll move on because we're not teaching history either. Now, the book that I'm uh, working my way through at the moment is this one. Um, Kathleen Norris. The title is A Seedier and Me. You can't see that very easily. It's down there. Um, I picked up another of her books in a home that I stayed in on my travels. Uh, one of the joys of my traveling is that... Uh, uh, I hate hotels so because they're dangerous and they're inhuman places. So I always ask people who invite me, well, I'd much prefer staying with families. And uh, on this last trip with Craig, who's doing all the work for this podcast, uh, we ended up with old friends of mine I hadn't seen for many years. Uh, we only spent one evening with them because they had to go off to Chicago, so they left us with the house. Um and we just had to lock up and we left. Wonderful people. Uh, but on their shelf, I found a, a book by Kathleen Norris, not the one I'm reading now, but another one which I will get in due course. And I enjoyed reading her. Now, she's a poet, married to a poet. That, that must lead to some problems with organization and the story is semi-autobiographical. Acedia and me. Acedia is an old idea. In fact... Uh, Dorothy Sayers, in her piece on Torrance, says uh, sloth was what was meant by a seedier in the past. But the word doesn't translate completely. It's not just laziness. It's that feeling which is a lot of people are having after COVID. I don't want to get out of bed this morning. I don't want to go to work. I'd rather stay home and knit, as one of my friends put it. That lack of drive, it's terrible. It's deadening and it's endemic now to a considerable degree. And she writes about it in a very interesting way. Uh, she's been very interested in 4th century monks that she ran into accidentally and they had things to say to her about the nature of uh, this lack of performance. And it's not a small issue that we're talking with, so talking about. So I'm leaving you with a lot of loose ends as usual because you're smart enough, I know from the correspondence, to pick them up and, and, get, and run with them and then send me the responses to the running, which educates me. I get a free education in a very good way. But... Her husband got quite sick, and she describes the difficulties they have when she was flat and he was flat. Like her kids are now, many of them. No joie de vivre. Couldn't, she couldn't do her poetry. Now, she said, you could go to the psychiatrist and be given drugs which would make you feel better, but do nothing for creativity. In fact, they suppress it. I think many of the psycho tropic drugs are not given for the patient's benefit, but for ours. It, uh, what they do, especially with some schizophrenics, is to make them incapable of complaining into our world. 
they become uh, docile and unresponsive. And many of them will tell you, I don't like the pills. I'm not me when I'm taking them. Uh, we're using this sort of pharmacological approach to problems across the board. I mean, uh, the number of kids now on drugs for uh, inattention at school is astonishing. That is not, not, this is new. Uh, now that our real kids are out of control in that sense, uh, the autistic spectrum, clearly the number of people with those kinds of symptoms have increased dramatically as well. I suspect for somewhat similar reasons, at least in part. No certain narrative. Uh, a certain narrative can pull you through in due course in most cases. I'm not talking about the biochemical disorders of the mind, which we're learning more and more about, uh, but the simple day-to-day -day problems of which we're having more and more difficulties. Uh, I'm sure I don't have to rub it in about the difficulty of getting going. Uh, I, I, during COVID, it got to me as well. I think it's one of the effects of the, uh, the vaccine. I'm not sure, but a lot of people are saying, yes, it is. Certainly, uh, there's a lot of pathology that we can't explain, and we ought to be more open about that than we are being. And we'll be forced to, to be in due course because it will show up in productivity and everything else. Finding people to do the work even is going to be harder and harder. Uh, when I look at something like the, the, the Claudine Gay fiasco and think of the people that I was taught by, and we all respected our teachers because there were no affirmative actions to the level of the professor. Uh, you got there because of what you knew and what you could do. It was real. C.S. Lewis famously would walk into the lecture room with the porter ho ho opening the door, and he had a big booming voice, and start his lecture as he walked to the lectern, and it would be continuous, and the last word would be spoken as he went out through the door. The whole thing. He wasn't reading it. Uh, he knew it. And you could go to your prof, uh, and they would, you'd have a good question. Say, That's a good question. You might go and look up, and then they would give you three or four names as to where you would probably find it, and you would. And I can still remember some of those conversations where I learned important things. The best teaching, of course, in medicine is bedside, uh, where the person doing the teaching is a good physician and is not reading notes that they want you to memorize. It's creating something much richer than that, which is hard to describe. But you, you can see it every now and again. Um, and it comes from long reading and long study. Uh, I was, I'm afraid, and I have to admit it, uh, I manipulated the ivory tower to my own advantage very successfully. I did a few years of, of medicine, and it, it was very hard work, uh, long hours. And I had four children, and my wife persuaded me to do a PhD in order to see my children. And I found that was much more delightful uh, in all respects. I was able to dig into subjects that it intrigued me. I didn't have to do what I didn't want to do. It was very self-indulgent. Uh, when the PhD was over, uh, off we went again at Sally's, uh, what's the word, instruction, I suppose. Find something useful to do with the results of your PhD in a nice place, preferably warm. Four children in snowsuits, that's a lot of work, especially when you have only one functional arm. Uh, and we ended up in Jamaica for seven years, where pay, looked after by the Wellcome Trust, wonderful employers, wonderful employers. So, unfortunately, it was very successful. So by the time I came, after that was over, I ended up in Ottawa, in Canada. And I had never had notes given to me, handouts, when I was a student. And I had never given, never prepared handouts to students. So... I had to give some lectures, so I walked in and gave a lecture. 
Uh, no handouts. Uh, the students who were only there for grades were furious and went to the dean and complained, but uh, a good percentage of them said, no, we want more. That was interesting. Uh, I had to give in and give the, uh, the brainless ones handouts that they could memorize and then pretend that they were educated. But I got to know the ones that were actually interested in learning a lot more. And of course, you, when you get to know them, I, I mean, I in, inadvertently, uh, again, by my wife, uh, invited some students from a small tutorial type uh, uh, course that I gave. Uh, it was small because I made sure that I made the lecture so difficult to begin with that I only got 20 good students. Uh, the rest gave up the course within a week or two. But then uh, I said to Sally one day, you know, I'm feeling a bit guilty uh, for two reasons. One was four lines from the 12th century, Bernard of Clairvaux, and they go like this. Some seek knowledge for the sake of knowledge. That is curiosity. Others seek knowledge in order that they themselves may be known. That is vanity. From that day onwards, I call my CV not my curriculum vitae, but my curriculum vanitas. Others seek knowledge in order to sell it. That is dishonorable. And there are a few who seek knowledge to or in order to edify others, and that is love. I was not guilty of the fourth, but I'd done the other three. I did feel guilty. I said to Sally, you know, uh, I ought to do something about it. She said, well, why don't you bring your students home to supper? I said, would you feed them? She said, of course I will. So we had 20 students to supper. To my amazement, they all came. And Sally's a good cook. We had a good meal. And then we started talking. And they didn't leave till midnight. We didn't play any silly games or introduce yourself with uh, something important about yourself. Now, they came from good homes in most cases, but they'd never had serious discussions at their dining room table. They needed them. When I, I said, well, everybody has to deal with at least nine questions because it's, to be human, you have to deal with these questions. They didn't know them. Where did I come from? Where am I going? Why am I here? Death, suffering, justice, how do I deal with them? How do I know that I know? What should I do with that knowledge and how should I live? Those nine questions go back to the, the beginning of writing. We don't even know who first formulated them. There are many versions of that. Interestingly enough, I tested AI this week by asking them about what are the existential problems that we face and AI would not, it's, it's algorithm, it's, what's the word I want? It's got, it, the devil's got his grip on the world. So the first question, where did I come from, is not considered by AI to be an important question. It's a very important question. But this is already too long a, a talk. Uh, I get out of control and have to be edited down, I'm sure. I don't go and look at where it comes out, but as in the end. But I do get some nice comments from you, so uh, uh, keep the comments coming. I've left enough loose ends to keep you going for a, a week at least, but a long while. And as you develop your own understanding of the answers to those questions, you become a lot more useful to other people. And of course, Eventually, you get the statement, the question, where do you get all this stuff from? And the answer is simple. I read. I started reading at about the age of four uh, when I was lying to bed with a false diagnosis for a couple of months. And so my mother taught me to read because otherwise I'd be unoccupied. Uh, and I've been reading ever since. I would say that on average, I'd probably read one book a week 
unrelated to any academic needs. Now I'm getting older, I'm rereading more slowly. So I, as well as reading new books, I'm reading a lot of old ones again, some very long ones. And uh, uh, I think quite soon we're going to have a, uh, another visitor on the podcast to talk about the strange story of sexuality and what it does to culture. But I leave that hanging there. Um, some of you might be interested in how this gets done. Craig does it for nothing, uh, so do I. So, But uh, there are some young people who would like to help us. And Craig tells me that some he could find young people who could, uh, for a small salary, a uh, hundred bucks a, a month, so to speak, would put in a few hours so that you could take snippets out of this and put it onto social media so we could put some sense in there as well. If you'd like to help, you can think about how you might do that. Uh, blessings on you all. Thank you guys for listening. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Be sure to share it with a friend. And if you have any questions, be sure to reach out. You can check the links below for how to do that. We appreciate you guys all, and we'll see you next week. Bye.